Hey Axis and Allies players, this is the Good Captain. Welcome to another video on Axis and Allies Classic. This video is titled Is Axis and Allies Classic Imbalanced or Broken? Part 3. And I should say that the previous part was part 2. Where was part 1? Well, it was the 10th video in my series, my initial series. That was the first time we looked at balance issues in any way. And in the previous video, I identified three areas that I call the silver bullets, three silver bullets that break the game in favor of the Allies. Uh, and the community uh, in general has solved this, for the most part, with a bidding system, which makes sense to some degree but it does change the face of the game significantly. By adding pieces to the board in various areas, you're creating a highly variable setup that is um, just going to be different with whomever and whenever and however you play to some degree. So I'm going to try to do something a little different and not I'm trying to tackle this without using a bidding system and using subtle and nuanced rules, most of which will be actually found in the out-of-box rules. So again, I'm going to try to not leave the box when I uh, try to fix this. So the first question we want to ask is, can the classic be fixed without a bid? And my answer is that yes, but you'll need to use some of the optional rules on page 31 of the rule book. So without leaving the rule book, we can actually unchamber most of these silver bullets. So if you'll recall, the first of the silver bullets was Russia's turn one attack. Well, we can get rid of that by implementing the Russia restricted rule. And if you're not clear on where I'm getting this information, it's located here on page 31 of your manual. There are five optional rules in the back. See, it says here, you may want to incorporate any of the following rules variations if all players agree to them. And Russia restricted is definitely the most popular the USSR player is not allowed to attack until the second turn. This one neatly removes that silver bullet from the allied gun. The next issue is the UK2 industrial complex build. Luckily for us, this seems to have been identified as an issue by the play testers and uh, game designers and Larry Harris and the folks at Milton Bradley because in the back of the rule book there is a no new industrial complexes rule. So as you can see here, no new complexes. No new industrial complexes can be bought or placed. Only original complexes, those on the board since the start of the game, can be used. So by implementing this rule, the British cannot build those industries and you unchamber that silver bullet as well. Now, I know that there's uh, going to be some pushback on this rule. If you're going to remove the four pieces from the game, the four industrial complexes available to be built by any of the powers, you're also harming the Axis cause, right? It is very popular. In fact, everybody I played against and whenever I played, I always ended up putting at least one industry down as Japan, and it always went into Manchuria. But um, in my play group, and when I've been experimenting by myself, it's not as big a deal to be restricted in this way as the Axis. Two transports is very nearly the same cost of one industrial complex. Two transports cost 16 IPCs, one industry is 15, and you can move four troops across every turn. So um, and the geography of this sort of is okay for Japan as well. You can turn every territory on the Asian con eastern end of the Asian continent into a drop zone. If you build up enough transports, they can move two spaces down to French Indochina and load their cargo, and on their following turn, they can move back up, load up again, and drop into Manchuria. You have a massive land bridge on four uh, territories. Building more transports also has other um, benefits, mainly ensuring that the Americans never attempt to uh, deploy in the Pacific with so many quote-unquote soak units available to the Japanese. So I, I don't think it breaks the game for the Axis at, while 
at the same time making it so that the Allies can't suffocate the Axis with that two industrial complex build. Okay, so here we are. Uh, we fixed two of these and we've, we're still inside the rule book and then we come up to the UK, USA, Spanish Harlem and for this we really don't see any opportunity to correct for that silver bullet here. Um, the only three optional rules left are total victory which just means that you can't win the game if you lose one of your capitals. So they give the example the Germans have somehow captured uh, UK and Russia have lost Japan so there's no victory for Axis here until they free Japan so that that doesn't help. Then there's the other one that says placing your naval units in enemy occupied sea zones. This is for the situation where base rules state that if enemy naval units are adjacent to a territory with an industrial complex, then the person who owns the complex cannot place new naval units in that sea zone. So this gets rid of that if you don't like it. And then the last one is weapons development benefits. Uh, Germany starts with jet power, Japan starts with super subs. None of these three address the core problem of Spanish Harlem. And so what are we to do? And for the first time, I am going to advocate for I, what technically, I, I grudgingly call this a house rule. Technically it is a house rule because this does not exist in the second edition rule manual. Uh, but I advocate for strict neutrals. And this is a quote from the Axis and Allies 1942 an anniversary edition game manual. It states that you cannot attack neutral territories, move into them, or move over them with air units. This is absolutely what I would employ in Axis and Allies Classic 2nd Edition to unbreak the game, to say nothing of balance. If the Allies are not allowed to commit the ahistorical situation of landing troops and building up an army in Spain, to uproot Germany, this would be the best way to do that. It's subtle, it's nuanced, it doesn't involve a bid, it's just enough to get the job done without being overly offensive to the initial setup, the rules, and the manual, etc. So I, that's why I call this slide Spanish Harlem and the house rule in quotes that fixes it. I put it in quotes because this is a standard rule in Axis Analysis 1942, an anniversary edition, so it's one that many of us should be familiar with. Um, so just to review, once we have that strict neutrals house rule implemented, you have unchambered all three of these silver bullets. So is it imbalanced now? And my opinion... This is my opinion, in summation, after playing many games against many different people all through the year 2019 and 2018, I would say it's only slightly in favor of the Allies. So I've changed my mind over the course of the year. At my initial burst, I was feeling it was actually slightly Axis favored, but I always keep my mind open to being changed because I don't like to be wrong a second longer than I have to be. So if somebody comes up to me with better evidence or a better argument, I'll change my mind. So I did research, I played a lot of different people, I spoke with a lot of different people, but I'm only going to say it's slightly in favor of the Allies after you make these three adjustments. It's only slightly. I would very easily run a game of Classic with those three optional rules implemented. And the only adjustment I would make or request, again, not asking for a bid, if I was playing an opponent who said that they were a 9 or a 10 level opponent. In other words, they played classic enough that they you know, knew all the ropes, they knew what I was talking about when it came to these things, these little bugs, and um, uh, they said they were savvy with the game. I would ask that we reduce the caucus to 4 infantry instead of 5, and we increase the, the German-Ukraine SSR from 3 to 4. So you just, if in a live game, you're just taking one chip from the Caucasus where the Russians are and moving that white chip under the Germans in the Ukraine SSR. And that's it. The higher level experienced players I'd definitely play that with. If somebody said that they were a 1 through 4 level experience, you know, again, scale of 1 to 10, I wouldn't ask for any optional rules. Anybody who said they were 5, 6, uh, or 7, 
I would ask for at least one or two of those optional rules to be in place from the back of the manual there. 8, 9, or 10, I'd probably go for all the optional rules, and if I was playing somebody who seriously knew their stuff, I would ask for to flip the chip from the Ukraine to the Caucasus. So, in summation, making those three corrections to Axis and Allies Classic, using those two optional rules plus the one rule from 42 and Anniversary about strict neutrals, like I just call that Axis and Allies Classic version 1.1. I was going to put a name to it. it. doesn't need it to be anything fancy because it basically is the game. It's just the game with the optional, a couple of optional rules added in. And if I was going to add, it, make this change uh, in regards to the troops on the east front, I would call it version 1.2. And that is a very mild alteration to the setup. It doesn't mess with the historicity of the game. You're not creating ahistorical events like uh, you would with a bid if you dropped a ton of the German infantry into Africa. That That would not be historically correct in my opinion um, or well represented by the game uh, engine so uh, yeah that's this is the summation of my research I do consider this matter for the most part for me closed there is one matter I, I did state that I would share my data so I will very quickly scroll through a thing at the end here but I'm not going to talk too much about it it's I, I just now, didn't couldn't find a way of presenting it that would be really that interesting, but I'll say I'll just close it here. Thanks for watching this. This was uh, really fun to do. I will continue to play classic, but I probably won't create any more videos about it unless something new or revolutionary pops up. But I, I just wanted to bot every I, cross every T, and deliver the final product. I consider this the final product. Uh, I'll very quickly now. Uh, pull up my stats. This could be a video unto itself, but you can see that I recorded the name of the player, the date which we played, and my opponent's side. I boxed, uh, checked the box of whether we played with one of the balancing rules in the back, one of the three major balancing rules. Uh, I recorded who won, and I, in my comments, which you won't be able to see on YouTube, I, I did write comments to myself so that I could remember what happened in the game. Um, and then in some of the games, uh, I recorded the dice rolls. So uh, if anybody got diced in one way or the other, uh, then it was recorded there as well. So all of the games here are a matter of public record. They're play-by-form games. I also played games on games by email on Vassal, on YouTube, so uh, they're not all on here, but these are forum games. So uh, that's it. Uh, so we'll close it here. Thank you for watching this. All the best from the good captain, and bye-bye.